Hey, Nicole Huntsman, your astrologer from ModernCosmic.com. Uh, I wanted to offer you guys a little uh, insight, I suppose, into the houses today. And I haven't done any videos in a while on kind of techniques that you can play with. So this isn't a technique so much as it's a way of looking at the houses through visualization that might help you, you know, look at your charts in a different way. So you need to have a basic understanding of houses and an understanding of uh, the just the basic building blocks of, of astrology. Okay, before. So if you don't know those things yet, this video is probably going to be too advanced. So first of all, starting with the first house, I want to talk about with, with the houses, the houses, even the, the name house suggests a space that is, you know, has limits to it. It's a, it's a, it's a particular space with a perhaps edges. <laughs> and with the houses, these show circumstances in our life. And so I think visualizing them as an actual space in your head when you're looking at the planets there and the zodiac signs, it helps you to create a picture. So the first house, I want you to imagine, to me, this is the Aries house. And when I think of the first house, I think of a person, maybe I've watched too many sci-fi movies, but it's almost like this robot, <laughs> this cyborg that is all of a sudden like powered up and they're like alive. But they're like naked standing there, you know. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> and, and the first house sort of tells us that there are planets that fall in the first house. Many times those are very much parts of that person's reality. That they, they'll identify with those planets. So like a Venus is there. Like I have Venus in my first house, you know. Um, a big part of how I relate to other people is I try to be kind and uh, friendly and I like to use manners and I don't like when people don't use manners and you know that kind of thing. It's like it was built into my DNA so to speak, built into my code. Okay, that's kind of the first house. So it's your physicality. It's also, the first house is kind of unconscious. If you think about what it is, I mean, it's representing the space. It's what was on the eastern horizon rising that moment you were born. So uh, you were a baby then. So you didn't have language. You're, you know, you're pre-verbal. Um, this is, people would argue that this is, you know, pre-conscious thinking. So you're kind of unconscious. So the first house is sort of unconscious. It's like a robot, again, that's like just come online, but doesn't really have anything happening inside, right? Um, so this house does have more to do just with kind of the physicality of the body, in my mind, that the style that you're going to kind of use your body without really even realizing you're doing it. All right. So some babies, when they're born, scream their heads off and have traumatic, some have traumatic births. Some are really quiet and looking around, you know, that's the first house. Okay. Second house, Second house, I like to think of this one as, I don't have a really good visual on this one. It's more just kind of like your possessions. It's almost the things that you're holding on to. If you've ever seen that tarot card of, uh, what is it? It's one of the pentacles. Is it the fifth or sixth? I don't remember. It's the guy, he's like holding the pentacles. He's like holding them somehow, possessing things. Okay. So this kind of shows me how does this person hold on to things? And what is it that they're holding on to? What is it? It's like they're drowning. What are they going to grab? What are they grabbing to survive, to not get pulled down, to get pulled under? Um, that's kind of second house. I know it's not a very good, that's not the best metaphor. I'm working on that one still. Okay, third house is the house of communication. This one, as far as a room goes, I don't think of a room so much as I think of trees. I think of two trees with a bunch of birds. And they're just like chirping at each other and the birds are flying back and forth. I also think of someone asking a question and someone else answering it, and then them asking a question and them answering This question answer, this volleying back and forth, it's a process of movement. It also makes me think of a, almost like a pinball machine, you know, things bouncing off place to place to place to place, ultimately with a goal, but sort of uh, this process of figuring out, you know, pinball, you got to play it over and over again. Once you learn the tricks, then you like know which way to make it go, right? Um, that's kind of Gemini's. Gemini's are here. They ask. There's a, they're question askers. They're here to seek through curiosity and discovery. Um, I also, on a very simple level, I kind of think of a classroom, but I like this visual of the trees with the birds a little bit better. Um, they're kind of talking about what they're gonna. What are we doing? What's next? You know, what's happening? Anything that falls into the third house will have kind of a business to it. It will have a, a mental component. It will have a question asking, seeking kind of quality to it. Um, a busyness. Fourth house I think of as a cave. Now, I have Scorpio in my fourth house. So maybe that's why I think of it as a cave, but also it's the womb. So it's going to look different. Look at, with all of these, by the way, the zodiac sign that's on the cusp and if there's another sign in there as well. This is, these are the, the adjectives that are going to describe the space. 
so with mine, my cave, I kind of came about these through sort of meditating. And this one is a dark cave, and it's, I'm by myself, and it's like rock. And it's safe. There's like some light shining in. It's safe in there, but it's like dark, and it's just me. And it's perfectly fine, and I like it. <laughs> For other people, theirs are like these crystalline, sparkly caves. You know, some people, they're, the place that they need to go to that's their womb, that's that unconscious, safe space, is really beautiful. And so look at the look at the zodiac signs to give it some flavor. Also, those of us who have Neptune, I have this there, or who have Pisces, we may have a fantasy version that we lay on top of that we go to, an imaginary home, an imaginary sense of, of safety and belonging. We can have a sense that our earthly home is not our real family or our real home. We can feel like it's missing or there's something about our seeking for sort of our soul family even in this life okay so we maybe have a, an overlay let's see a prettier version of our little cave <laughs> okay fourth house is i don't necessarily have a well i have a stage so stage is kind of the fourth or the fifth house fifth house is leo whatever falls here those planets need to be expressed they need to be extroverted and seen and recognized by others so that's the stage, or it's a podium, or it's a you know forum. It's a where this person, if they've got a loaded fifth house, that they've got a lot of Leo in their personality. They they need to be seen, okay? They don't, and they want to to be. They want to achieve something. They want to be recognized for having done something well, okay? It's the, it's also it's royalty, you know. So think of a king and a queen, or a queen. They sit on a throne, above, separated from you know. The, their subjects and their subjects look to them and they hold space as these figureheads okay so that's the stuff that falls in the fifth house that has this element of of showmanship to it or needing to be expressed needing to be seen or heard or felt okay um sixth house is the virgo house and i think of with this one it's between like a pure white room where i see like a devotee on the ground in an act of prayer, you know, or it's a chapel, like an ancient old chapel, or it's the same thing. And I go, okay, what are they praying to? What are they serving? And if the sun is there, that means we've got someone who identifies as a person who needs to be in the role of the devotee, right? To something, look, depending on the rest of the chart. If it's, you know, Venus, whatever it is, this, this is the thing that this person may, if it's Venus, for example, we could have someone who, um, with their love life, they're always giving, 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 giving. They are praying to, in a sense, love and romance, and or this thought that if I give and give and give, that somehow I will receive blessings from on high, you know. So, et cetera, et cetera. You, you know, use your imagination with that one. Seventh house is the house of partnership. This one, to me, feels more like a space where it's a mirror, and you see someone in the mirror, and they kind of look like you, but they're maybe doing different things than you're doing. So it's like they're mirroring you, but yet yeah, not exactly. And I don't think of the seventh house as necessarily a marriage house. It is the house that show. It's the house that shows what you will marry yourself to. What are you going to marry your life to? So I uh, had a, a class at the ISAR conference where the teacher was talking about Capricorn in the seventh house. I have a lot of clients with this, actually, that ask me about marriage because either they don't want to get married or they, they're waiting or like relationships are really difficult for them. And he's talking about Pluto moving into the seventh and how like, oh, that might mean, you know, your relationships, your relationship might break up, right? And, and, and it could for sure. But what is it that you're relating to? A lot of people with Capricorn in the seventh house are workaholics and their work, their business is their relationship. So does that mean that their work partnership is going to change and shift completely? Yes, probably. You know, so it's what are you looking at? What are you mirroring with? What are you partnering with to better understand who you are? And it could be a person. It could be a thing. It could be an animal. It could be a, a cause. It could be a lot of things. Look at the zodiac signs to get more, to, to, to fill in the blanks for the adjectives, to describe the mirror. Um, we then move into the eighth house, which I love. <laughs> when I finally saw when I saw this, I was like, oh, yes, I love this. So for the eighth house, I had a dream about this, actually. And it was like a ah, scary dream. And I woke up from it and I wrote it down because I'm like, oh, that's perfect. So the eighth house is a well. It's a nighttime. It's black outside. It's dark. And there's a well. And you have to, for some reason, go down into the bottom of this well. You, you can see some water down there, a little reflection. But you have to go down there. And you know that whatever's on the bottom of that well, it, there's some prizes, treasure, okay? There's some good stuff down there. But to get down there, you, get, you have to go in the well, and it's scary. You don't know what's between you and the 
and the treasure on the bottom. So that's the eighth house. And people who have uh, their son in the eighth house have to go on a journey many times to recover themselves, their identity. There's a part of themselves that is hidden from themselves, or it's almost as though like an ogre stole you and hid you down in there. Well, you have to go in there and you have to get it and bring it back and reclaim it for yourself. Okay. And out of this process, if you've got a son in the eighth house that hasn't been resolved yet, once you've gone in there and reclaimed your personal power, you suddenly have an ability to, it's like, that's pretty magical. Scorpio's gift is, is that of empowering you. Like I died, but I was reborn. You can't keep me down, you know? So it gives strength. I have my moon there, you know? So like anyone with the moon in the eighth, there's, it's the unconscious realm, like diving down and finding family, belonging, home, all of that stuff. And I have my South Node there too. So it's like past life storylines, like pulling it all up. It's all family related. It's all like a woman by herself, la la la, you know? So anyway, go in the well important. Then we have the ninth house, which is the Sagittarius house. This one to me feels like we're sitting in the woods with Yoda. <laughs> and he has like a magical projector and he's going to project a screen of the journey of your life. And it's going to be in particular, well, on this journey in particular, you're going to, he's going to have you pay attention to what it is you're learning. How are you growing and expanding through this journey? Which processes, which places in life, will it be relationship, career, transcendence through religion? Like how are you going to grow? Um, are you going to have to completely dissolve and let go of something in your life in order to grow? Are you going to have to experience abuse? Are you going to, you know, like there's some hairy stuff that we go through as humans that lead to our growth ultimately. So, okay, so watch the movie, take notes on whatever Yoda says, look at the zodiac signs and the planets, they'll give you stories and look at the rulers. 10th house is career. So the 10th house to me feels like a scoreboard. It's kind of like a pyramid, a stepped pyramid where there are like people lined up all in the pyramid. There's like a hierarchy of just a few at the top and a lot at the bottom, but I'm like, eh, that kind of works. But it's also to me, it's like a scoreboard. It's your own personal scoreboard. It's like people who have a lot of planets in the 10th house care about the score. They, they tend to worry if their score is, if they're not doing well, you know, they, they compare themselves to where it is they think they should be in life. It can be career related. It can be, am I married or not? It can be whatever, my reputation, you know? Um, the, you know, you can have someone who is very sensitive and it's not about their career. It's about their reputation with friends and family. They're so worried to say what they really think and they have such guilt that, that they keep things to themselves and eats them up inside. That can also be 10th house. So look at, the, again, the zodiac signs, the, play, the planets, look at the whole chart. But that's, think of it as kind of, in a sense, a scoreboard. Um, okay, how do I measure up? 11th house is my favorite. I love 12th house too. These are my, is where it gets fun. 11th house is the house I think of as the house of collective consciousness. It's to me, think of a space, maybe a white space, could be white or black, whatever, a solid field with one point of light for every human being that's currently alive in this space. And somehow you have the ability to look around the space and see all these points of light. You can be in the middle of it. So cool, right? Um, now, would you be able to find your point of light? Might be kind of hard, unless there's something that I don't know about. So there's a disassociation here. There's being part of the wholeness here. You know you're there, but you're just maybe not quite sure how to get to that part of yourself. It's fragmented. It's all broken up into its, these individual points of light, but it's still all one thing, right? Kind of like Leo the opposite, which is the sun. It's one single star. Whereas you move to Aquarius, and it's all of our stars, okay? You step back and maybe it creates a picture. Maybe it's this beautiful, undulating, you know, crystal of lights or something. I don't know. Point being, the 11th house, planets that fall there, we tend to be disassociated from. I have my Mars there. There's a big part of me. It's also exactly squares my nodes. There's a big part with a Mars in the 12th house of the body being disassociated from the body. It's like having a Mars in Aquarius. It's the same thing. So being disassociated from the body and being able to disassociate from the body, there's that as well. Also being able to receive information from any planet that falls there. It's as though we can experience humanity's experience of this planet if we want to. It's kind of, can be a little bit overwhelming. And so sometimes we'll pull back from that and disassociate from it because it's a little too much to handle. But um, anything that lands in this house, many times you're going to use on behalf of the collective because you understand the collective through that lens, okay? Um, then finally, we've got the 12th house. 12th house is the house of Pisces. This one has to do with the ultimate, it's the oneness. So I, I think of this one as a nebulous 
body of plasma of some kind, okay, where everything's been melted. It's almost like the stars that were in the other. Let's say those were diamonds that were ground up into little points of light or something beautiful. It's like we've melted it all, and it's just all one thing. You know, Twelfth House is all, it's every human experience that we've had, past, present, future. Maybe even animals are in there, just all of it. It's just experience. It's the memory that we have of existence. If we are all different points of light that represent God, maybe it's just all the things we've seen collected and gathered together in one wholeness. In a person's birth chart, any planets that fall there are planets that this person, they are things that this person has done or identified with in their reincarnations that they identify with so strongly. It's been such a theme for them that it's really hard for them to, um, in a sense, to kind of let go of those those parts of themselves. It, it's almost like they become owned and become one of the collective group of human experiences. So like, for example, um, I'll use mine just because I know it. So Saturn is in mine. Saturn in the 12th house is one where we've had lives of being responsible. We've had lives where we've had grief. We've, we've had lives where mine's in Leo. So it was like, what, and my son's in my second house. So my personal survival relied upon me being the responsible party, like put on your big girl panties and um, survive the situation. Okay, good job, you know? So it's like hardship, work, struggle, having to be the stoic one, having to be the only one, etc., etc. Okay. But I contribute that to the, you know, it's been contributed to the to the collective experience. And I have to, in order for me to access that that Saturn of mine, it's almost like you have to deep dive for it. It's like it's not yours. It's almost like it's owned by the collective. It's owned by all your past experiences. So it can be difficult to access that. Um, I'll give a better example. Let's say your son is in the 12th house. This is people, anyone who has planets in their 12th house, I think past life regression work is excellent for. I think it's good for everyone. But those in particular, because the themes of the past life, it's like they're, they're stuff that, that they can almost see. They can almost feel it in that plasma. <laughs> whatever, they can almost like locate who it is that they are, son, but not quite. There's a missing piece. And if there's a particular storyline, if you've, if you've had lives where you've been, um, you've sacrificed your life through war, you've sacrificed your life religiously, you've sacrificed your life through dying in childbirth or whatever it is, like it's as though being someone in this life is really difficult because your usage is giving it up. So you have to kind of like figure out what happened with this particular part of myself and why is it still stuck, melted into the cosmic embryo, am, amniotic fluid instead of here with me. You have to kind of, again, kind of in a sense, reclaim it, reintegrate it into who you are here and now. So I hope that was helpful. Um, and let me know your thoughts if you have any other sort of visualizations. The ones I'm still working on, I need better, better visualization for like Taurus, which is not surprising. It's Taurus after all. Um, it's very much about the here and the now. But I need a better one for Taurus. I like Gemini okay. And maybe a better one for the sixth house. So if you have thoughts, throw them in. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye.